Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome again to the new lecture of uh, this course fundamentals and applications of dielectric ceramics. So let us just recap uh, what we did in the last class. So in the last class we looked at uh, detail little bit further into impedance spectroscopy. And this is a very useful tool to determine the dielectric characteristics of the materials. So, many materials show non ideal behavior and as a result uh, their description is incomplete by a device circuit. So, as a result you would, you would like to invoke other electrical circuits to model them and for this it is, it is useful to measure properties such as complex impedance. Complex impedance contains real and imaginary part which are basically uh, uh, calculated by measuring z and theta. So, theta will also allow you to measure that loss tangent and from this modulus electrical impedance you can determine modulus and by combining temperature dependent, temperature and time dependent measurements, time means frequency right, dependent measurements. One can determine things like R i C i, i means certain entity. So, resistances and capacitances you can also calculate what are the uh, time constants and from these temperature dependence of these one can also determine what is the activation energy and then one can look into mechanisms of uh, electrical dielectric materials, mechanism, mechanisms of conduction etcetera. So, you might have vacancies, you might have interstitials, you might have uh, impurity atoms so on and so forth. So, different things will have different entities will have different time constants and they will have different temperature dependence and frequency dependence. As a result, uh, you can uh, look into different mechanisms uh, a little bit more clearly and by combining this impedance and the modular spectroscopy, the differences become more uh, amplified or you can say uh, clear. So, this is one way to characterize dielectric materials and a very useful man, uh, way and uh, then we looked at dielectric breakdown and dielectric breakdown is basically uh, when the dielectric materials become conducting or they stop functioning as a dielectric and this is uh, this could be because of increase in electron temperature or sudden conductivity or because of thermal uh, build up temperature build up again makes materials conducting and it could also be because of defects in the material such as porosity, grain boundaries etcetera. So, there are multiple mechanisms that we briefly discussed, we did not get into details of this, but if you want to get into details of dielectric breakdown, I suggested to read this book uh, Principles of uh, Electronic Ceramics. by Henchen West. So, this is a very nice book which gives you a good insight into dielectric breakdown. So, now what we are going to continue uh, about in this lecture is we will look at, uh, we will now continue our discussion into what we call as nonlinear dielectrics. Okay. And nonlinear dielectrics we mean by by this what we mean is that when you apply electric field let us say polarization. So, we saw in case of linear dielectric that P is equal to epsilon naught into epsilon r minus 1 into E. This is what is the, so basically this polarization increases as a function of electric field linearly. So, when the field is 0 the polarization is 0. So, as a result you have a linear variation of uh, polarization. This is what is a linear dielectric. Okay. But in case of non-linear dielectrics, especially at higher fields, you might have different effects. So, for example, a ferroelectric material will show a hysteresis loop, a polarization switching loop like this. It has certain linear part at low fields, but that linear part is limited. But rest of the places, the curve is pretty non-linear. So, this is a non-linear dielectric. So, these non-linear dielectrics have special characteristics. And generally we classify them in three categories, one is called as piezoelectric, 
second is called as pyroelectric and third is called as ferroelectric and these have crystallographic basis of distinction as well as thermodynamic basis. to understand these. So, what we will do is that in begin to begin with. So, so far what we did earlier, we looked at the polar properties of a dielectric in mostly in scalar form, but to understand ferroelectrics, piezoelectrics and pyroelectrics, it is important to invoke uh, the tensor form of these properties. So, what we will do is that first we will introduce the formal notations for these properties in the tensor form. Okay. So, what we will do first is that we will look at uh, the, the properties uh, relevant to these materials in tensor form. So, I assume that you have some knowledge of of tensors and matrices. Okay, and you would also have some knowledge of thermodynamics. If you do not have knowledge of these subjects, then I would say you look at the other uh, MOOC courses or other books. Okay. So, for example, for uh, looking at tensor properties of crystals, I can recommend by Nye. This is a very nice book on uh, tensor properties of crystals and uh, let me give you one or two more references. So, this is basically you can say physical properties of crystals. Physical properties of crystals by uh, Nye, J F, J F Nye basically. So, this is first book and then uh, to learn about thermodynamics you can read. Let me give you so, second one could be the modern course in statistical physics, which is by L. E. Reichel, and third I can recommend is principles. And applications of uh, ferroelectrics and related materials. This is uh, by M. E. Lyons and A. M. Glass. This is a classic book on ferroelectricity, uh, which gives go, goes a bit into phase transitions and thermodynamics and things like that. This is more about statistical mechanics, thermodynamics. This is more about tensor properties or physical properties of crystals. So these are some books. Otherwise, there are a lot of other books. You can also uh, look at them. So let's begin with some discussion on this. So we will. So our discussion will remain on. Basically, we will use uh, system will be coordinate system will be Cartesian and uh, we will. So, we will use x y z coordinates and then z will be considered as perpendicular to the to the plane of the film or plane of the substrate or plane of the paper. Okay. So, let us first begin with the tensor definition of properties. Okay. So, first let us begin with the uh, dielectric permittivity. So, dielectric prop among dielectric properties the first thing that we know is the polarization right, which we saw is P, but in this case we determine as P i. So, that determines the so i determines the direction right and the co units are coulomb per meter square. So, when you apply a electric field vector, let us say electric field is also E i, it could be E i, E j, E z whatever. So, 
again this is in volt per meter. So, when you apply electric field to a dielectric crystal you generate a polarization and this polarization is written at P i is equal to chi i j E j. Okay. So, this is your basically applied electric field vector E j and this is the polarization P i. And uh, so, you apply the field in j direction and you measure the field in uh, i direction uh, polarization i direction and this chi i j is known as uh, susceptibility uh, tensor. So, just like we have magnetic susceptibility here we have dielectric susceptibility. So, this is dielectric susceptibility tensor this is in farad per meter and as you can see this is a second rank tensor. So, basically chi i j you can write as chi 1 1, chi 1 2, chi 1 3, chi 2 1, chi 2 2, chi 2 3, chi 3 1, chi 3 2 and chi 3 3. So, uh, this relation however, is valid only for linear dielectrics or the linear portion of the nonlinear dielectric. So, when you make polarization versus electric field diagram for a nonlinear dielectric, you can apply this relation only to the linear region of that, that, that plot not to the other plot. So, now uh, let us see what is the uh, total surface charge density. So, total surface charge density which is essentially uh, dielectric displacement. when you apply electric field. So, we can write this as d i to be equal to epsilon naught e i plus p i. So, here this is permittivity of free free space which is 8.85 into 10 to the minus 12 farad per meter and E i is the basically you can say the, the field and P i is the polarization that is generated. So, now if you combine the, so if you let us say if you write this as equation number 1 and if you write this as equation number 2, I can write this D i as D i can be written as epsilon naught E i plus uh, chi i j E j. Okay. And this can be written as uh, epsilon naught delta i j e j plus chi i j e j, which can be written as epsilon naught delta i j plus chi i j into e j, where delta i j is called as Kronecker delta which is equal to 1 if i is equal to j and 0 if i is not equal to j. Okay. And, uh, and this particular thing is called as uh, basically you can write this as epsilon i j e j. So, epsilon i j is equal to epsilon naught delta i j plus chi i j and this is basically the dielectric permittivity that we say dielectric which we were earlier writing in case of uh, in, in the form of scalar form okay. and this epsilon i j is basically you can say it is a product of epsilon naught into something right. So, it is epsilon naught delta i j plus chi i j and this for a ferroelectric kind of material for the materials for which the susceptibility is really large for them for materials with you can say large susceptibility you can say this is equal to chi i j because the free free space component is very very small and we can also write this epsilon i j as epsilon r i j into epsilon naught or kappa i j into epsilon naught where this is called as dielectric constant. So, when you say high k dielectric or low k dielectric this is the kappa and which is also nothing but epsilon r. Okay. So, 
this is what is the more useful term epsilon r or kappa than epsilon ij okay so you can see that uh, here also that epsilon ij is a is a rank 2 tensor so which means it has nine components often we will see in many of these electric properties or other properties as well of second rank tensor third rank tensor fourth rank tensor is that they although the, let me just briefly introduce what tensor is so we know that tensor is defined by a rank uh, by the formula 3 to power n so when n is equal to 0 it has one component so this will become a scalar when n is equal to 1 it will have three components so this will become a vector when n is equal to 1 it will have nine components n equal to 2 sorry then it will have it will be second rank tensor so vector is a rank 1 tensor okay so this is uh, this will have nine components so this is a tensor of rank 2 when you go to n is equal to 3 you will have 27 components and then it will be a tensor of rank 3 and generally we see up to 10 to power uh, n is equal to 4 which is 81 components and this will be tensor of rank 4 so this is how these will be so when you have when you see something like epsilon ij it is basically tensor of rank Okay. So, this is what it will be. So, when you write for example, as we will see in case of stiffness, if you write F S I J K L, then this is tensor of rank 4, it will have 81 components, but we are fortunate that crystal symmetry and thermodynamic arguments reduce the number of components, but this is how it is this notation means. So, this is uh, as we say is the dielectric and uh, in case of dielectric permittivity, we say that epsilon I J uh, is uh, uh, is this so epsilon ij ij is a rank tensor of rank 2 so it will have nine components but basically uh, using the using the free energy uh, arguments this reduces to uh, six independent components so that we will see later on okay So, you can have thermodynamic consideration, you can have crystal consideration and so on and so forth. So, 9 is reduced to 6 using thermodynamic con considerations and 6 can be reduced to even further if you have. So, for example, if you take for a cubic crystal, it will have lesser components. If you go for a monoclinic or a tetragonal crystal, it will have more. So, more asymmetric the crystal is, more the components you will have. More symmetric the crystal is, lesser the number of components will be. So, that is a general guideline. So, these 9 components can be reduced to further lower number depending upon the crystal symmetry and thermodynamics. So, now let us look at the second aspect that is elastic properties. So, in the elastic properties let us first define the stress. So, this is stress which is in Newton per beta square. So, this is capital X i j. So, this is the stress that is applied and then you measure the strain which is small x i j which is strain which is unitless. So, if you apply stress on a elastic material within the linear region within elastic limit you apply Hooke's law right. And what does this Hooke's law say? This says x i j is equal to small s i j k l into capital X uh, k l. Okay. So, this is the stress, this is elastic compliance whose unit is no, it is inverse of Newton meter square, so meter square. And this is strain. So, you can see here that stress is a rank 2 tensor and strain is again a rank 2 tensor. The elastic compliance as a result is rank 4 tensor. 
So, this is the proportionality constant basically it turns out to be rank 4 tensor. So, basically you can say it is a and stress is rank 2, strain is rank 2 and so you can write st stress as uh, x 1 1, x 1 2, x 1 3, x 2 1, x 2 2, x 2 3, x 3 1, x 3 2, x 3 3. So, it has 9 components, but by symmetry it will reduce to 6. Similarly, strain will also reduce to 6 because these two are equivalent, this and that is equivalent and these two are equivalent. So, as a result you will reduce them to 6 components because of crystal symmetry. So, this is the relationship between strain and stress using elastic compliance as a proportionality factor. So, this is uh, equation number let us say. So, we may have to use numbering system. So, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3 and uh, is that 4? Yeah, this is 4 and let us come to equation number. So, and, and the inverse form of the above, above equation is. So, inverse relation would be x i j is equal to c i j k l into x k l. So, this is strain, this is elastic stiffness or elastic modulus, this is again a rank 4 tensor, this is in Newton per meter square and this is a stress. Okay. So, now that you have elastic you have, so, so this is let us say 4 a. Okay. So, we know that these, these two equations are related to each other. So, as a result we can relate the stiffness and the compliance using the relation. So, we can relate them as uh, small s i j k l into small c k l m n. This is equal to c i j k l into small s k l m n and this is equal to delta i m into delta j n. So, obviously, uh, delta i m is equal to 1 when i is equal to m and so basically delta i m is equal to 1 when i is equal to m and is equal to 0 when i is not equal to m. Similarly, delta j n is equal to 1 when j is equal to n is equal to 0 when j is not equal to n and this you can write the matrices and prove it it's 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 not difficult to prove it so so this is the relationship between the elastic compliance and the stiffness and let's say this is equation number 4b okay so this stress and strain tensors are so stress is I j these are all as we said second rank tensor, but they are symmetric in nature. Okay. And what it means is that basically chi i j is equal to chi uh, sorry x i j is equal to x j i and small x i j is equal to a small x j i. So, as a result the total number of uh, uh, total number reduces to uh, 6. So, basically 6 components. And when this happens, uh, as a result, uh, since you have a strain, there is a symmetry in a stress strain, this also reduces the number of components in uh, stiffness. So, for example, compliance becomes S i j k l to S j i l k. So, number of uh, similarly, you can write for the C slash S. So, for a both stiffness and compliance, the number of components. So, in a fourth rank tensor, you will have 81. So, this 81 reduces to 36. So, you can write the matrix and then you can use the symmetry arguments and see which ones are similar. Be because we are saying i j is equal to j i and i j is equal to j i for a strain also, what it also means is that uh, this uh, uh, k l will be equal to l k. So, when you make these uh, 
combinations you will see that 81 components will reduce to 36 and crystal symmetry further reduces these components to 21. So, when you apply crystal symmetry because crystals are symmetry symmetric. So, the crystal symmetry arguments further reduces these two lower numbers such as 21 or so and uh, so when you apply crystal symmetry plus thermodynamics actually I should say both of them. So, both of these arguments reduce to 21 or lower. So, we are fortunate that from 81 we get down to 21 or even lower components and for symmetric crystals which we generally deal with have even lower number of components. So, it makes life easier. So, this is this is uh, uh, tensor notation for uh, elastic properties. Now, let us we do not look into plastic properties because dielectric materials are ceramic materials as a result they do not have plastic deformation. So, we mostly deal with the uh, elastic properties in this uh, in these materials. So, next we will look at uh, what we call as we probably are going to run out of time, but uh, next is what we call as piezo electric properties. So, let us first define piezoelectric materials, piezoelectric materials are are those which are first of all non centro symmetric ok. Among crystal classes there are certain classes which are centro symmetric, there are certain classes which are non centro symmetric. Non centro symmetric means they do not have lack of lacking a center of symmetry. So, for example, what, what, what does it mean? It means that let us say you have two points x y z and another point minus x minus y and minus z. If you have a center of symmetry, so if you have a center of symmetry then what you see, so if you do a inversion operation then x y z can be replicated to minus x minus y minus z if you have a center of symmetry, but if you do not have center of symmetry symmetry then x y z will not be equivalent to minus x minus y minus z. There is a very basic definition of piezoelectric materials. So, piezoelectric materials by definition have to be non centro symmetric that is a must requirement. Okay. So, we are, prob we, are, we are probably going to run out of time now. So, we will just briefly summarize this that we have discussed about some tensor properties of materials Ma mainly right now look at dielectric properties and elastic properties and we will further uh, discuss the piezoelectric properties and uh, other properties of these nonlinear dielectric materials in the next few lectures. Thank you. Mm -hmm.